I'm with Keller. Uh, we are very happy to be the sponsor of such a great uh, conversation discussion this uh, morning. Um, if you don't know, Keller is a uh, specialty design build contractor throughout North America and the world. In the Western U.S., we're probably synonymous with liquefaction mitigation. Keller and our parent company, or our previous company, Hayward Baker, have been participating and attending these events for over 40 years, and we're very happy to be here today um, to hopefully update and increase our knowledge of what the events are recently that have occurred in Syria and Turkey, and perhaps come to some realization or things, uh, adopt some methods that we can avoid such damage and loss of life in future. But unfortunately, as uh, Mark Twain once said, history may not always repeat itself, but it often rhymes. Um, I also want to give a plug for a Keller seminar series that we're holding on seismic topics once a month by experts in the seismic field. Three of them are here today, so uh, please stop by our booth or go on our LinkedIn present, uh, site and you can find out information on that and register. So with that, I give you the uh, panel on the Syria-Turkey earthquake. Folks. Good morning, and thank you all for joining us here in LA and online via live streaming uh, for our panel on Turkey and Syria earthquakes. And merhaba, hepiniz hoş geldiniz. Bugün burada Türkiye ve Syria Suriye depremleri için hazırladığımız panelimiz için panelimize hoş geldiniz. Panelimizin adı um, a disaster through. Uh, interdisciplinary lenses. Bir felaket, disciplinar arası bir bakışla. So what I will do, to, my name is Seda Gökyer Erbiş. I'm a geotechnical engineer who is based in the United States, but I am originally from Turkey. I'll be giving a brief introduction of the event before we get to our panelists. And um, we will, I'll be kind of showing some facts how it uh, extraordinary event that was happened in southern Turkey and northern Syria. Let me try to advance. All right. On February 6, 2023, at 4.17 a.m. in the morning, a magnitude 7.8 earthquake hit. Pazarcık Karhamamaraş, and just nine hours after, a magnitude 7.5 earthquake hit Elbistan Karhamamaraş in the southern Turkey and the northern Syria. And Turk this was at the junction of the three plates, Anatolian, Arabian, um, and, Arabian and the African plate. And it was most of the geotechnical earthquake engineers in this audience knows that Turkey is a seismically active area and we experienced uh, more than 21 earthquakes and, more, and magnitude more than seven since 1900. And one of the memorable ones in 1999 in other Pazara and earthquakes that really the, 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 the audience here knows pretty well about. But just to give an idea, oops. Just to give an idea about how large of an event it was, you're seeing the ruptured fault lines here what for the magnitude 7.8 earth, earthquake, as well as the 7.5. One of them is a 300 kilometers rupture length, and the other one is 160 kilometers of a rupture length. So just to give you a perspective on a Florida map, it was an extraordinary event that felt by the affected more than 10 cities in northern Syria. As a seismically, hazard, seismically high hazard country, Turkey has a very well established um, seismic, motion, seismic, se, se, seismic recording stations and the strong motion areas that you see on the Turkey map here showing the hazards which are, you can see the North Anatolian Fault and the East Anatolian Fault where this particular two large events had happened. And through, we have 
857 stations that recorded this uh, large two events. And you can really see the, the peak ground acceleration, so we call just to see how large of an, an extraordinary event it was. And the near field, basically near the fold, reaching up to almost 1 Gs and more than, slightly more than 1 Gs, as well as 50 to 100 kilometers away from the fold, still very large accelerations. And as engineers, we also look at the spectrum and there's these spect response spectra that are recorded from all these stations uh, that Alfad had throughout in the region. And just to, for your eyes, I wanted to, we wanted to compare it to a design spectrum that we kind of pulled for this area in California that you see in large, uh, in, in cyan color in there, just to give you a sense again how large the accelerations that were and the spectral accelerations were for this, for this event. So it was a big event and there were a lot of people affected, almost 10, pe uh, 10 million people directly affected and casualties as of March 23rd, 2023, 57,300. And there were a lot of people injured and millions dis displaced and basically living in homeless shelters. So we wanted to kind of take this moment right now before we get to our panelists to take a moment of silence for the people who, people who lost their lives. If you join me for that, thank you. Thank you, Sega. So, um, going into our panel, we have, um, we want to, uh, as you saw, the ground motions were extraordinary, and, but we do have some examples of resilient behavior, uh, which makes us think as geotechnical and earthquake engineers, can we do better than code? as uh, um, earthquakes will keep happening? How can we prevent them from becoming disasters? So we think that this is an interdisciplinary conversation. Um, and in line um, with what Marcia said and the new strategic plan of ASC and the GI, we want to encourage these conversations. Uh, so we have um, different lenses of um, uh, the panelists uh, all distinguished, some of them traveled from Turkey for this event. Um, and I will explain to you how it's going to go. We're gonna go in that order, and we have some pre-made questions that I think we thought are key for from most people to be um, here from the particular um, experts. So um, we will start with Professor uh, David Frost uh, from Georgia Tech, and. Uh, um, the head of the uh, year, uh, who is going to give us the, uh, the overall geotechnical observations and he's going to talk also about how he sees the future of reconnaissance, having been in the 99 um, uh, event as well and many more. Um, then we will have two of our, um, I would say, earlier career um, uh, professionals and academics, um, uh, Dr. Osgun Numanoglu, uh, from Schnabel Engineering, and um, Dr. Tuje Basser from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, they have prepared something very cool. They, um, they have deployed at least twice uh, there, and unfortunately, they have suffered personal losses from this event. Um, then we have two professors from Istanbul, um, both geotechnical engineers, uh, Dr. Ece Esler Baya, 
and um, uh, Dr. Pelling um, Tumako Ozener, um, who are going to talk about how geotechnical engineers are educated in Turkey, how, how do they practice after that, and um, they will show a very interesting study that they are following some buildings and observing foundation behavior. Um, and then we have, um, uh, and all of these people are GI members, so uh, we will have our designated structural engineer, um, director of projects in the Applied Technology Council, and a strong supporter of um, geotechnical reconnaissance missions, um, Aisa Hortaksu. She's going to talk about structural observations. She was in the scavenger um, uh, mission of ERI that was jointly done with uh, GEAR. And, um, Finally, we, we, I think we need to connect the human factor to what we do. Uh, so we have an amazing uh, social scientist that I have the honor of working with um, over the past couple of years, and um, uh, that is uh, Dr. Emel Ganapati. Uh, she's also originally from Turkey, and um, she is a professor in um, the Florida International University. Uh, hopefully, we're going to have time for questions, and uh, if not, uh, we will get what we can from this uh, live stream and continue. Um, so, um, what we, we wanted to mention, and all the, um, uh, the, the panelists wanted to convey, is that in, in this epic, unfortunate event, we had the luck of having uh, colleagues that are very technic technically advanced that would we were willing to share with us and help us bring knowledge uh, back in the United States. And that is, I think, priceless. So none of this would be happening if it wasn't for um, you know, their participation. And I'll, I'll, I think I will have it also at the end. Um, Finally, I, we have our two organizers. You already um, met Sega Goyer. She's with uh, Geocom. And Alaki Nagarajan, that everybody knows, she's with Bauer Foundations. They're going to be uh, moderating and taking um, the questions. Um, so I think it's Lucky next. Um, first, I would like to congratulate David on the 2023 ASCE Award. Congratulations, David. And the second, thank you so much for your service and the efforts in the industry. Um, and you have been the association of Geotechnical Extreme Recon, and that has become legendary. I understand that John Bray started this as a grassroots effort supported by the NSF through the Earthquake Hazard Mitigation Program that was led by Dr. Cliff. And GEAR was on the ground after the 1999 Turkey earthquake. There is definitely a shift in recon efforts since then. Right, David? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, pleasure to be here. Um, <clears throat> Um, in, in response to uh, Lucky's opening question, uh, indeed, I had the, the opportunity, and, and believe me, it was a wonderful opportunity to be in Turkey, in Coachelli, after the 99 event. <clears throat> and indeed, it was part of my motivation for wanting to be there um, 24 years later in, in a different part of Turkey, because I felt uh, being able to see uh, directly myself things and how they evolved and changed would, would be particularly fascinating. I think something that is very important that we don't lose sight of is that the 99 event was a magnitude 7.6, a certain amount of energy released with that. The first event two months ago was a magnitude 7.8. That's about twice the amount of energy being released and then it was followed up by a 7.5. So it's like you have uh, this, this very large event before it. And so I think as we start 
and we get into more detailed analysis and comparison of 99 with, with uh, 2023, we have to calibrate ourselves. We're not comparing apples and apples. Um, um, and, and so I think that's a very important factor. Um, uh, in a minute, I'm going to do a very quick uh, f um, uh, run through of just a few slides, which I'm really focusing on the geotechnical uh, damage and the types of observations from this time. There may be some images of certain buildings in there, uh, but, but uh, as you'll actually see, uh, my focus is on the geotech, and quite frankly, uh, uh, those buildings uh, performed very well. Uh, I'm not saying that all buildings performed well, but, but certainly those did. So I think I'm going to just quickly go to the slides now, and then sure. uh, I know you have a follow-up question for me. So. Uh, again, I wanted to put a slide up, and, and uh, <clears throat> importantly, and I realize uh, this time, unlike my lecture where I just gave people initials, this time I, I wanted to absolutely spell people's names out. Um, but uh, this is a different map than you've seen, uh, uh, other than the fact that all of these uh, dots um, represent locations that were visited by uh, on individuals conducting the reconnaissance. And uh, uh, in, in, it was important to recognize gear was there to help. There was a phenomenal response mounted by the Turkish geotechnical community. In fact, it was, it was um, uh, uh, most impressive to see how they developed their response. But more importantly, in order to be ready to do the kind of response that they did after this event, they did an awful lot of very important work over the last 20, 25 years in being ready, ready and in developing their expertise in terms of doing reconnaissance and in developing tools and technologies that facilitated it. So I, again, I wanted to list these individuals that were really part of the, the first two teams that uh, Gear sent there. Um, and, and, and I don't want to particularly pick out individuals, but clearly the first two uh, that, that were most important for us were uh, Dr. Ander Chetton from METU, and then uh, Dr. Rob Moss from Cal Poly uh, was our scout uh, team leader who went there. Um, I'm, I'm going to click. You've seen this famous building. Maybe what you haven't seen is the building from the other side, or maybe what you haven't seen is a close-up of the foundation. This was a building that obviously it was on a matte foundation, um, and the performance of the building uh, it itself was good. Uh, unfortunately, you have to have both building and structure perform well uh, it, 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 to, to, be true, to be truly successful. Um, uh, there was, in many areas, significant lateral spreads that we observed. Here are a selection from uh, a lake uh, that was west of the town of Golbachi. Golbachi was relatively uh, uh, close to the epicenter of the original event. And you can see uh, classic features of uh, lateral spreading um, and particularly migration towards the lake. Um, uh, in other areas, similar sort of things, except where uh, there had been human infrastructure built, and so you can see that it was not a matter of just lateral spreading of, of, of natural uh, gently slopes or whatever, but, but rather significant damage to um, uh, uh, adjacent highways um, and, and, and even some recreational areas. Um, uh, I put this Image, or these images here, not because of the buildings, uh, others will clearly talk uh, about them, but importantly, um, the building with the green on it, that was a building that was known to have pile foundations, and yet you can see uh, there was about uh, 60 centimeters, two feet of settlement at that building, um, and, and in the foreground, in, in the image, you can see, for example, how as the building came down or, or settled down, uh, it, it impinged on the fronts of the cars that had been parked there uh, prior to the event. That's the um, uh, another interesting case, this was also from Golbachi, but there was a series of buildings that um, had been very recently constructed, brand new buildings, 
they did impeccably well. They performed extremely well, but unfortunately, um, there was significant, again, settlement and tilting, uh, uh, relative tilting between some of the buildings. <clears throat> and so this was an example of a case where we went and made very detailed measurements of both tilt and, and uh, deformations at all corners and around the buildings. So it, it, it'll be the, the basis of a very nice um, uh, uh, case history. We also flew drones around a number of these locations. And so that we're using that, those imagery then uh, with structure from motion to actually be able to get uh, 3D um, um, uh, models of, of the area and what's happened. Um, the, the, uh, David, we have uh, one minute for okay. you. Uh, so this is, I think, my last slide anyway, but we're just showing, uh, again, additional uh, fault rupture and lateral spreading. And finally, uh, some highways were, were badly damaged, uh, particularly up towards the northeast end of the rupture zone. Uh, this is just showing some examples of that. And finally, uh, dams. There was not a catastrophic failure of a dam in terms of release of water, but there was some damage to uh, a number of dams, and this is showing the crest of one of the dams where there was clearly a, a large slip in the upward face. Thank you, David. Um, so I will go with the follow-up question. You may have 30 seconds to answer that. Fine. <laughs> um, so um, as a leader of gear, <clears throat> and someone who has been on the uh, second team who was on the ground, um, how is the transformation seen you know, of the geo recon efforts and uh, what is your vision for the future? So you may have noticed that I had this slide as a backdrop on every slide and that was intentional because this is actually the landing page for a piece of software that has been developed uh, by uh, our Turkish colleagues, uh, by a company called i4Works. Uh, the software is called SiteI, and literally it is, facilitates the, uh, the real-time integration of data. These images were being uploaded literally in real time, and so you could track and everybody who was in the field was part of the team, was contributing to this. So even though you can only see what, um, maybe uh, 40 dots here, uh, actually as you zoom in, those dots explode up. And I believe right now there is something in the order of eight and a half thousand images that are reflected in this and show the area. This is the future of recon. Uh, it's not just about the tools, it's about the integration of the tools and providing us with real-time knowledge uh, as we're in the field. Thank you, David. And we know every time we talk about technology, your face lights up, and it's very close to your heart. Thank you. Um, so before, uh, both of you represent the younger community uh, from academia and practice, and you're both from the region and experienced devastating impacts from the earthquake at a personal level. All of us in the GI community offer our sincere condolences to those who lost their loved ones, including you, your family, and the Turkish nation. And it's remarkable that you almost Im immediately deployed to the effective sites and the, your own personal missions. And I will have questions for you and I will pose them right after each other and I will let you speak. But before I go to my questions, I'm gonna start your cool drone footage to distract our audience while you're speaking. <laughs> All right. So my question to you, Özgün, is that how did this disaster in your hometown affect you in your recon efforts and your engineering practice in particular? And how did you use technology in this personal mission as we're seeing behind? And Tuche, what I, my question to you is one of your focuses in your recon is due infrastructure and major ground deformations. And can you talk to us about your observations from, the, from your mission? And how did you connect that to your research on climate change effects in 
uh, affecting geotechnics and especially considering all the floods happened right after these two earthquakes? So to answer the, the reconnaissance mission part of it first is, you know, there are a lot of experts here that probably done one or more reconnaissance. Reconnaissance is an intense mission. But when you're doing your first reconnaissance and you're going to your hometown to start with, is, is adding more intensity to it. And one of the challenges that I personally went through is you know, compartmentalizing the engineering aspect of it from the emotional attachment to the area. So that was a, that there was a ch challenge I constantly dealt with. And in terms of engineering practice, I'm a, a practitioner that's working in earthquake engineering area. And day-to-day -day basis, we work with our clients to you know, provide uh, better solutions to, uh, for earthquake resistance infrastructure. And being at the area and seeing the aftermath of a, such a disaster uh, reinforces my own perspective on why we should be very rigorous on you know, seismic engineering and, and practicing it in, 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 a, in a very careful uh, level. So in terms of lessons learned, we, we, there are many lessons learned, but personally, uh, our, one of significant lessons learned for us was uh, being able to con first connecting with the local experts in the area and you know, uh, communicating with them to understand what's going on and find the, uh, the most appropriate time to deploy. And one of the people that we connected, as David also mentioned, was Professor Honor Pekchan. And uh, based on our communications with him, we had uh, three drones and a drone operator uh, with us that set time to deploy the area. And, and then we went together to do the uh, five-day reconnaissance mission. Another uh, lessons learned, and I think this is the most important part, is speaking the language and knowing the culture around the area helps a lot when you're doing a reconnaissance. And when I say speaking the language, not only the you know, Turkish and knowing the area, you know, south is different than north, east is different than west. Like knowing the area and connecting at a personal level, level with the local people is very important. And when we were there with Tuche, Tuche was talking to, to the local people and also Sarhat was, you know, distributing candies to the kids. And when we were focusing on ex exactly this uh, uh, crack, one kid said that there is another crack in the back of their houses that we, did, we were not aware of. So that communication took us to the other crack. And when we were talking there with the locals, they said that, hey, do you want to see the houses? Because our house moved more than a meter. And then we went there. And based on our communication with the locals, we were able to collect all this information. So, and technology-wise, as you're seeing the videos, we were able to use three drones. And then these drones were uh, very helpful to access to the areas that are otherwise unsafe to go or inaccessible. So we deployed our drones to take uh, high resolution video so that after, uh, after the, the reconnaissance, we can look at the details and figure out what's going on in more detail. And as also David mentioned, we used uh, software SideEye that was developed by Professor Honor Pekcan and uh, a lot of other uh, people, Ahmed, uh, Turker, Atta, and all the other young professionals. So we uh, uploaded our data to their database and actively uh, mapped out the area to, to understand what should we be doing next day and next day. And this, all these uh, videos are publicly available in the software itself. Uh, the name of the software is a site I, and, and we uploaded all the data there. Anyone who wants to you know, have a further interest on the, the database, can sign up and, and use this data. And with that, Tuche, I'll... Uh, thank you. Um, I would like to first start with the large ground deformations. I we believe that one of the major root causes that transformed this um, natural hazard to a uh, catastrophic disaster is definitely, indeed, the large ground deformations, such as landslides, uh, fault ruptures, and liquefaction-induced ground subsidence. So these severely affected some critical infrastructure in the region. One example was the closing of the Hatay airport, and presumably because of the um, large liquefaction-induced um, cracks happened in the, um, the runway. And that airport was, uh, became functional after six days, and this time frame uh, was very detrimental in the rescue operations from disaster recovery and management perspectives because the rescue, the, the most critical time for the rescue operations was about um, first 72 hours. 
So another example was uh, that we observed, especially in Iskenderun district of Hatay, and there were large settlements, building settlements, or I would call them differential settlements uh, in the region. The whole coastal strip of Iskenderun settled ranging between 1.5 meter uh, down to um, 0.2 um, me meter. So this was very, so when we first went there, um, the whole coastal strip was just covered with sands because of liquefaction and also was also under um, the seawater. So it was flooded by seawater as well. So in terms of climate change um, acting as a stressor, uh, there was a, you're looking at this alternate Zealand, um, slope instability uh, problem. So there is a strong evidence that this was caused by a prolonged heavy rainfall right before the earthquake. So when we talk to the locals, like Özgün mentioned, uh, they mention of a uh, unusual heavy rainfall. Uh, and by the way, this region is semi-arid and it doesn't get a lot of precipitation. And then uh, we confirmed this with the annual precipitation values in the region and checking the, um, the precipitation right before the earthquake and we confirmed this um, uh, as well. And um, another uh, thing that to, to focus on here, probably um, the, you're looking at this flooding event. It may just seem like a flash flooding because of the rainfall, unusual uh, heavy rainfall, but this actually caused by the landslides, seismically induced landslides right after the earthquake sequences. And uh, these landslides actually blocked some of the stream, bed stream, um, stream beds and some of the rivers and that material was just uh, started flowing as debris and mud flow um, uh, towards the region and killing more than 15 people in Adiyaman and uh, Shamnurfa. So um, these are also called cascading events. I would like to get your attention to um, climate change driven cascading events. So this is a, a unique, uh, one of the unique examples of these um, catastrophes. So as a conclusion, um, so these events that observations and information that we collected from locals and from authorities uh, exemplify a unique coupling of climate change and then the earthquake uh, events. Well, thank you. Thank you, Tutsa. Right. That I'm moving to our next set of panelists from Turkey who joined us here to give their local experience and some observations. Ece and Pelin, um, I know you guys both for, for years, you um, have studied here in the US and now back in Turkey, both associate professors in Istanbul and remain dedicated GI members, thank you for that. And, we, and you also quickly formed teams to the area uh, to do observations, uh, geotechnical observations. And I will start with you, Ece, and as, with a question. As, as being a professor in Turkey, do you think our four-year engineering curriculum is enough to deliver good engineering service uh, for a country with a high earthquake risk? And, and also, if you can share some of your observations of the site amplification, specifically at Iskenderun, as we also saw the, the lateral spread, spreadings and all the foundation um, f um, settlements through David's slides and the drone footage. So, and Pelin, um, for you, you're particularly focusing on the data collection and studies in liquefaction and foundation performance, and you have identified some buildings that um, behaved well against the odds, which is great. We would like to see those resilient uh, buildings, building examples. And would, would you be sharing your observations about those foundation performances? Thank you. Thank you, Seda. Um, yes, uh, we already um, talked about the, the fact that uh, we have to accept uh, Turkey is an earthquake prone country and uh, we experience uh, moderate to high uh, magnitude earthquakes uh, almost every 10 years. 
um, we did improve in terms of, I think, uh, earthquake engineering education, uh, in terms of codes and uh, engineering practice. However, uh, we still observe similar scenes, similar failures uh, related to soil and foundation conditions. I think the reason owes to many factors, including um, maybe education, uh, lack of professional engineering license, and improper inspection. A safe civil engineering design includes uh, many geotechnical and structural tasks interconnected to each other. During four year undergraduate education, probably as in US also, uh, we teach geotechnical fundamentals and structural fundamentals separately. Um, maybe in, in Turkey, maybe we can have geotechnical earthquake engineering also right now as an elective course, but maybe, I don't know, maybe uh, as a uh, uh, mandatory course during undergraduate uh, education. But what we do is after graduation, during uh, master's or doctoral studies, or in practice, we teach um, the integration between soils, uh, soil engineering or geotechnical engineering and structures such as soil structure interaction. Um, but this knowledge and experience in Turkey right now is not assured by a professional engineering license. Another issue is um, quality control and quality assurance has been just initiated after the year of 2000 for new buildings. However, uh, I think this also needs to be strictly controlled by the government. Right now, the contractors can hire the inspection companies. Um, uh, we uh, observed the consequences of this uh, major earthquake uh, and in terms of geotechnical earthquake engineering point of view, and we focused on Iskenderun case. We obtained um, the ground motion recorded in station 3116, uh, which is almost five to 10 kilometers to Iskenderun center, Chai district, uh, with uh, peak ground acceleration of 0.16 G. And based on the preliminary site investigation data we obtained from Iskenderun, we performed one, the equivalent linear analysis, site response analysis, and we obtained the surface accelerations uh, around uh, amplified to 0.27 G. Um, we identified 28 buildings with damages along the Iskenderun shoreline, and most of these buildings were uh, four to five stories, and some of them up to 12 stories. Most of them were residential buildings. Um, and these buildings were exposed to remarkably amplified spectral accelerations, probably due to the wide range of predominant periods of the outcrop motion, and which coincides also, also with the site uh, fundamental period. Um, uh, this particular earthquake demonstrated us that um, Design with SSI, sometimes maybe it may not fall on the safe side of the spectrum. And site-specific analysis with SSI needs to be considered and emphasized in these type of soils. And also our uh, early analysis results demonstrated that displacement-based analysis with SSI needs to be considered in these type of liquefiable soils. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Seda. And uh, okay. so uh, the buildings at Chai District were observed to be undergone severe liquefaction, as all other panels stated. And uh, we have uh, just made our observations related to the foundation performance and uh, the foundation performances uh, of different foundations and. Uh, different ground, uh, improved ground conditions were observed during the reconnaissance study. I just collected here the four different types, and uh, they are including uh, generally in general the ch uh, along Chai district, district, the shallow foundations without basement, and we uh, also observed the ones that with uh, deep foundations like piled foundations, but with, uh, with improved and with the unimproved ones. So we were able to just compare their behavior in terms of settlements that we have uh, seen here. 
uh, the numbers uh, that indicate these buildings and the uh, severe liquefaction effect uh, that they were subjected and the settlements that they, have, uh, they were undergone during the earthquake. And uh, the data that the data and the settlement measurements that we collected from uh, our uh, reconnaissance study, we just evaluated them in terms of uh, settlement and we converted to a grand, uh, grand failure index uh, based on a brace study uh, following 1919 earthquakes. So we used this grand failure criteria to be able to classify how the soils were performed, I mean how the uh, foundations performed during this uh, liquefaction uh, effect. And uh, you can see that, for example, for uh, the numbers, uh, for uh, we just numbered uh, the 28 buildings, uh, and this, uh, they, uh, we selected uh, their uh, different foundation performances. And you can see that this, the, where we see the uh, less settlement effort, we can uh, just see that the ground failure index was low. And for the pile foundations, uh, for the pile foundations, even with, uh, with um, grant, uh, improved grant conditions, they just, we were seeing that they performed very well and they, the buildings were more resilient. So, uh, and the ones uh, that were uh, piled but without uh, improved con soil conditions, we have seen again a severe liquefaction settlement. So uh, we can say that uh, in conclusion, uh, the structures uh, or our preliminary early findings from our geotechnical reconnaissance study show that structures designed ignoring the soil conditions unfortunately remain vulnerable. And the uh, solution should just uh, consider the, uh, the site conditions with the uh, soil structure interaction and the site specific study should be is, uh, should be just uh, uh, should be just applied in here, and uh, more. Uh, we need, uh, I think, okay. We need uh, to just uh, in order to be able to just perform this site-specific uh, evaluation. We need an expertised engineers that will be or licensed engineers that will be doing this uh, work uh, during the uh, site-specific. Uh, performance and uh, this uh, site soil interaction things, uh, especially in this kind of earthquake situations. Thank, Thank you, you very much. With that, I will so we are down to last two panelists. Um, Aisha, this is uh, something, uh, you know, you're a structural engineer species. Um, and everyone in this room, all of Thanks. us, uh, love you so much, the structural engineers. Um, you were also deployed in your home country representing EERI in their initial recon evaluation. Um, can you give us, similar to David, an overview of the structural damage and tell us what are the most striking observations? Also, as someone who is instrumental in putting together seismic guidelines for design and screening of buildings, what do you see the biggest obstacle as part of the rebuilding efforts and in improving impacts from earthquake that will happen again in Turkey and Syria and globally so they don't become more of a disaster? Thank you, Lucky. Again, thank you for having me the structural engineer at your event. <laughs> now I know what John Stewart feels like when he attends our meetings. <laughs> so I have the task of telling you about st structural damage to 700,000 buildings in about seven minutes. So bear with me. Uh, first, I want to tell you about the typical construction. And in this recon mission, we were traveling very fast. We were the scouts uh, for other uh, missions that will follow. Um, so we, we were not taking measurements, we were not counting buildings, we were not asking for drawings, so my observations are uh, an overview. The typical construction that we uh, typically saw were reinforced concrete frames with clay, um, hollow clay tile infill walls. This is very typical in Turkey. It's been used since 1960s, and it's still the, the, the common type of construction, even in the modern days, but until about 2000, they were using um, 
smooth bars and the concrete uh, quality was low, and you've all read about the lack of construction enforcement and code enforcement. So those are all uh, potential contributing factors to the damage we saw. Um, these pictures have some typical damages. Uh, the picture on the left, the vertical one, with the big spray painted Y on it, this is a building that has been marked for demolition. Y stands for Yukmak, which is demolition. And this one has formed plastic hinges at the bottom of each of the columns. The building next to it is a picture perfect demonstration of a soft story formation. This is another very common occurrence in this earthquake where um, due to weaknesses on these, er in these initial floors, the buildings don't have enough strength. So when it starts shaking, they just topple over. And in many cases, this type of mechanism leads to total collapse. So this is actually a rare picture that I found in our files that shows it still standing up, but it's not good enough. The picture on top demonstrates a captive column, which means that little part in the middle, it, the, the columns were really short, so they just really got tight in there and they broke. And this is actually a school. The good news is that this is the only school building that we saw this level of damage to. So Turkey has invested a lot of money in strengthening their school buildings and hospitals over the last 15 years, and we certainly saw that in effect. It's one of those rare cases where you wish the kids were in school, because if the earthquake had happened later in the day, perhaps the lives of the children would have been saved, not in this building, but in many of the other school buildings that we saw that were intact. Uh, next to it, on the now <laughs> going clockwise, um, there's a building that's showing a lot of the typical damage we, that we saw. This is really heavy damage to the infill walls. These are really scary for the inhabitants. It's still a hazard for you. It could fall on your head. It can block your egress. And it's really difficult to repair this type of damage. So this clay infill walls cause really uh, large, costly damages. And the bottom picture on the, um, on, the, on the right is, to me, a demonstration of, it's a question. Uh, one of the things we talk a lot about are performance objectives in structural engineering. Is it collapse prevention? Is it life safety? And life safety means you can egress. Clearly, this person did not trust the stairwell in, his, in their building. They could not trust their front exit, so they had to make a way out from their third floor balcony. So these are all things we have to think about now that we have real lived experiences of what a performance object objective looks like on the field. This is a map of uh, the structural damage assessments. Um, the, the, the database is a little confusing. This illustration is from a data set from uh, February 20th. So that's about two weeks after the earthquake and shows about 140,000 buildings. Um, but the official data that was published at the uh, beginning of March actually says that about 1.7 million buildings had been inspected. This is four weeks after the earthquake. Um, I did the math at some point, and it comes to about 100 buildings per day per inspector, which is about five minutes per building. I also work at ATC, Applied Technology, ATC 20. Um, it's, this is the red, yellow, green placarding method. We recommend about 15 minutes per building, so these inspectors had to work really fast. The reason I think they were able to do this is that in this earthquake, the damage was either severe or none. There are very, very few cases where they noted medium damage, and medium damage is typically the one you have to think a little harder, take a little longer to do the assessment. So if we look at the numbers in the bottom, that counts to about 230,000 buildings that are collapsed, heavily damaged, or marked for demolition. 230,000 buildings, a lot of them the, being these four, five, six-story residential buildings with at least 10 units in them, that is a lot of residences lost. One other thing I want to point out is that on a recon mission, what we what you don't see, you don't know. We were standing in this corner, and this is yet another pile of rubble, right? But then we were able to come home and look at it on Street View, and it used to be the center of town. This is happening, there's people shopping, 
And this is very common occurrence that the centers of these towns that are called Marquez or Charshu, literally meaning shopping area, were hit the most. And that is because these areas have been settled earliest, which means the buildings are older, and then they had devastating damage. Um, you have 40 seconds. Ooh, okay. Uh, Non-structural components. Uh, this is a very important concept that we also have to think about. This is a hospital that was not functioning on day 12 because they had, rub they had um, rubble falling from the ceiling and they had lost their water from the city and they also lost their water from their uh, reserve tanks. So this is one of the many hospitals we saw that was not functioning and that is not what you want when you have so many casualties. And so, thank you. Thank you, Aisha. So the last panelist we have is Emil. Um, so Emil, um, you are an accomplished social scientist with a background in urban planning who has conducted disaster research in Turkey, Haiti, um, Nepal, in addition to US territories, Puerto Rico. That's a lot. And uh, your last name suggests that you're Indian and I have to talk to you about it later. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you're originally from Turkey. And your parents are uh, from the affected area itself, right? Mm -hmm. um, after the 1999 earthquake in Turkey, you also lived with disaster survivors in a prefabricated area uh, for months to study the post-disaster uh, reconstruction and resilience. From the si so, uh, social science perspective, how do you think the Turkish government should handle the rebuilding process uh, for the million plus who need housing? Um, also, how can engineering contribute beyond their technical calculations for the people and eventually the policy makers, um, you know, to better understand the assumptions in codes and concepts and risk? Uh, finally, what are the common threats in the communities that we see all the time? Thank you so much for the wonderful introduction, Lucky, and thank you to all our um, organizers of this panel. I mean, they've worked so hard and I'm so happy to be uh, the only social scientist like <laughs> Aisha, you know. Uh, thank you so much for the um, invitation to be here. Um, so I wanted to talk about, based on my experiences um, in Turkey, prior experiences in Turkey and in other countries, I wanted to talk about some of our priorities as we move forward. So I'm gonna highlight four priorities here. One of them relates to um, new construction. Uh, another one is going to be about what we do with the old housing stock in um, these towns. Um, and the other are more general um, concerns um, that I want to emphasize. So the first priority is about the speed of rebuilding. So this is the one that's related to uh, rebuilding of new homes. Unlike the US where the government doesn't take an active role in actually constructing new buildings, in Turkey, the central government um, produces homes, they, they actually construct homes for those who lost their homes um, or whose homes are heavily damaged from the earthquake. Um, after the 1999 earthquake, um, uh, they actually uh, built homes within approximately two years. And at the time, according to the World Bank country director, World Bank was also involved in these reconstruction efforts but because they provided um, a loan to the Turkish government. So this was one of the uh, most rapid reconstruction efforts in the world um, based on his experiences in other contexts. As you may have heard, after this particular disaster, uh, President Erdogan, who is campaigning for um, another round of election, uh, he suggested that they're going to rebuild homes in one of these provinces and nine other provinces within um, a matter of uh, a year. Um, now, you know, they might be able to produce, uh, because of their past track record, as I mentioned earlier, they, they might be able to produce some of these homes within a matter of a year. Um, but we have to ask ourselves at what cost. Uh, so my prior research indicates that people are going to have, and we are hearing these already, people are going to have concerns about the quality of construction if you're going to do this really quickly, right? Um, are people going to cut corners again, as we have seen um, in these pictures? 
Um, another um, issue uh, that's going to be affected by this focus on rapid construction is um, that they're already actually uh, sidestepping planning, urban planning rules and regulations. Uh, the president passed a new law authorizing one of the ministries in the country uh, to dedicate areas for construction of permanent homes um, uh, without waiting for urban plans to be prepared and approved. So all they need to do is to look at soil and geological considerations, um, which is what you all do. But you know what the government is uh, saying basically now urban plans don't matter, we can just go ahead and move forward um, rebuilding these homes. Um, and another downside of rebuilding fast is that um, people who lived in these towns, um, uh, some of them are still there, others have left uh, their communities, they are not having a voice in the recovery process, they are not uh, being asked about where and how they would like to live from now on. And it's not just the people, even the local governments um, are being overlooked. And which uh, this is what all happened also after the 1999 earthquake. So the first priority that I would like to mention as we move forward in rebuilding cities is um, not uh, to put too much emphasis on building fast. We have to take the time that is needed uh, to get the input from the people um, and to do things uh, right. Now, the second um, priority in rebuilding that I would like to emphasize, uh, uh, it relates to social equity concerns. Uh, disasters often exacerbate uh, pre-existing inequities, and they might create new ones. We have seen this over and over in different contexts. In Haiti, for instance, when we did uh, work after the 2010 earthquake, um, the inequities in terms of distribution of tents, it created a lot of tensions between those who had proper tents and those who had to create their own tents um, to, to uh, live in. And I'm going to read you a quote from one of the um, persons that we interviewed at that time. So he told us that people enter the camps and use knives and razor blades to slice your tent open out of selfishness. People have thrown dirty oil on my tent just because I had a tent and they didn't. I understand that Haiti is a very unique context, right? However, we have witnessed similar issues in Turkey after the 1999 um, earthquake. Uh, the government, when they produce homes, actually the picture that you see, the apartments that you see um, uh, on one end, um, uh, that's, those are homes produced by the World Bank um, funding, and there were um, differences in terms of the sizes of these homes and other homes that were built by the Turkish government. So some people received much smaller homes compared to others, and this created a lot of tension um, within the communities. Um, and um, moving forward to uh, this particular earthquake and the region that was affected uh, by this earthquake, there were already um, uh, a lot of uh, inequities in the area. This area is a historically less developed region with significant gender inequities. Uh, that's a topic for another day. Uh, but there are also different ethnic and religious groups. We have Kurds, we have uh, Alevis, which is a group of Muslims uh, that belong to a particular sect. You have Christians, Jewish populations, and Syrians uh, who have fled uh, the country's civil war. And prior to the earthquake, uh, there were already significant tensions between the majority and some of these groups, especially the Syrians. And we see this in news coverage as well. So the Syrians are the first ones to be blamed when um, there's looting um, in uh, these damaged homes. So we have to really think about uh, the social equity issues as we rebuild these cities. Um, and um, think, you know, we cannot turn a blind eye to pre-existing inequities and the new inequities um, government policies might be creating. Uh, we have to tackle these uh, issues early on, address unique needs of different groups, and also learn to prevent and deal with um, social conflict in the affected area. 
the third priority that I would like to mention, um, it relates to the old housing stock. Um, and uh, what I would like to mention is we should not ignore the major retrofitting needs of the existing housing stock. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the Turkish government rebuilds homes if your home was completely destroyed or heavily damaged. But they do provide funding for retrofitting your home if your home uh, had minor damage or had moderate damage. And um, this is actually a picture that I took after the 1999 earthquake in Gyorgyuk, the epicenter of that earthquake. Um, uh, because uh, I, I love this picture because it really captures the concerns that people had about these homes. The government provided funding for retrofitting the old housing stock, but it was not enough to retrofit the whole, you know, the whole structure. In most cases, people only retrofitted um, one or two floors and left the rest of the building um, unretrofitted. And that's why you see, you know, in this place, if you see um, the Turkish signs, it says, oh, you know, we fixed this piece apartment, come in, you know, if you're looking for um, a rent, uh, to rent a place or purchase a place, because people didn't want to own it, they didn't want to live in these places, they knew the risks involved. And I'm going to also read you a quote from, um, a, a leader in one of the neighborhoods in Gyorgyuk, which explains the extent of her worries about these kind of structures. So she told me, I know some people who stopped their retrofitting on the first floor. That building is now receiving, receiving the permit for occupancy. Can you imagine what will happen to that building in the next earthquake? It will not sway sideways. It will fly from the floor where homeowners stopped the retrofitting. Um, Therefore, you know, our third resilience priority needs to um, be to make sure that we are addressing uh, the needs of retrofitting in the old um, housing stock. Um, so we cannot just focus on, which is what happened after the 1999 earthquake, a lot of the fo focus was on the new housing stock that's being built and much less emphasis was paid to uh, the old housing stock. So we cannot look beyond um, these issues um, and uh, we need to provide a required financial and technical assistance to people who are uh, going to stay in these um, cities. The last uh, priority that I would like to mention as we rebuild um, in the aftermath of disaster events um, is that we really need to look beyond the short term um, and think about the long term as well. Um, if we want to create resilient cities, in most cases after these type of disasters, a lot of our focus is on the short term needs, right? So people need homes, of course they need food and other types of aid. Um, we need to provide them with tents. Um, yes, all these things are important, um, but long term issues matter as well. Um, we have to have also a more holistic approach uh, to planning, uh, unlike what they're doing right now. As I said, they already uh, said the urban plans, we don't have to wait for them. So we cannot do these kind of things if we want to have uh, resilient cities. We have to also think about the interrelationships between different aspects of recovery. Housing recovery might affect business recovery or vice versa. Where we put the debris might affect people's uh, psychological recovery. So we have to think about these type of interrelationships. And also right now, of course, a lot of the focus in Turkey is on the earthquakes. Um, but we have to think about other disasters like flooding. The picture, one of the pictures you see here, it shows the flooding damage that you see in a um, um, tent uh, city, which was established by the government. Um, so we have to think of other disasters as well and think long term, think about the impacts of climate change in these cities. So we actually build uh, uh, cities that are not just resilient in the short term, but also in the long term. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emil. Um, so um, thank you to each and every panelist, and thank you to the organizers, and thank you to the sponsors. Um, I want to leave you all with this quote. The earth is not ours. It's a treasure we hold in trust for future generations. Always remember that. 
um, Kofi Annan. Um, and this is a very important discussion today we had. And this needs to continue and will be continued. Uh, feel free to send us any of your comments, questions, um, anything else you would like us to do. Uh, please send us your um, uh, notes. And uh, GI will follow, uh, will have follow up events based on this. Um, stay tuned. There is one warning I want to tell you. Uh, so, as you can see, this whole panel is like women heavy. This was not planned. Um, and all the women were chosen based on their qualities. So give them a big applause. Thank you very much. I said stay tuned, so sit down. Just a few announcements, I promise I'll make it uh, quick. So first, just want to remind you, you all have access to the conference proceedings. You've all worked too hard writing these papers to let those go unread, so you have an obligation to go and get the proceedings and read other people's papers so that they will then in turn read yours. Um, PDH forms are available. Lindsay mentioned this earlier today, continuing education credits, so go to the registration desk and get those. You'll receive an email in about four weeks with a list of the um, sessions that you attended. Thanks again to Keller for sponsoring this, and Tim, great job with the umbrella. It's a perfect idea for today. Uh, and thanks to all of our sponsors for helping support the GEO Congress. Um, also, Marcy was talking about the uh, ASCE efforts and the infrastructure bill. If you're interested in how you can get involved, go check out the GI booth. There's a little presentation there. I haven't done it yet, so maybe join me in the exhibit hall to watch that presentation um, right after this. And uh, while you're there, you can make a contribution to the, um, to the student uh, fund as well. If you want to get one of those uh, green, the Feel the Teal shirts, or the Terzaghi bobblehead, or the, the socks, or a number of things. Oh, the Geo Congress 23 trucker hats are there too. And uh, that's it. I'll see you back here at 1 this afternoon for the Ralph B. Peck lecture, some engaging geopits, and our closing ceremony. Thank you.